hello, I will stand up. <laughs> um, my name is Maria Negruza. I am a game economy designer at Gameloft. And a little bit about myself. Um, I put it in pictures here. Uh, so this was my childhood here. Um, I started playing Pong when I was well, too young to remember. And then I watched a lot of Cartoon Network. <laughs> And then I played all these amazing games on my PCs. Um, then I discovered that I could play on my mobile phone, which was like a huge revelation for me. I used to play Snake. I still play Snake, so I still have my Nokia, and I still open it, and I still play Snake every now and then. Um, and then I turned like super casual, playing well mobile and Facebook games a lot. And then my dream came true, and I started making <laughs> games, um, which were Facebook games, and then Game Loft. Let me move away so you can see all these amazing logos. <laughs> um, so what does a game economy designer do at Game Loft? Um, they have to benchmark games, so keep up with the market, the trends, everything. They have to balance all the games they work on. Uh, they have to do systems design, um, which means, I don't know, gotchas, everything that, that would monetize in a game. Um, they do the monetization strategy, which is something that we're going to discuss today. And they take data-driven decisions. And talking about data, I feel the need to introduce you to this fine lady here. <laughs> Hello. Oh, OK, this is loud. Uh, I am Alexandra Dragulin, working as a business performance manager at Gameloft. Uh, I've been with Gameloft for the past five years. Uh, I think I was just graduating college when I first got hired there. Um, and I started working in the business intelligence department. So I kind of grew with data and went with it at every step of the way. So from uh, creating the support needed to get the data, to processing um, the data, and ultimately taking decision driven, uh, data driven decisions as a business performance manager. Uh, specifically, what this uh, implies, well, OK, we have a bit of an issue with the G strategy over there. It was supposed to go there. I don't know what happened. Um, so what I do together with the team, I set the G strategy and the targets for our games. Um, and uh, to maintain the strategy to make sure that, say, between updates, we um, achieve our goals, I take care of live operations. Um, and we'll detail that later a bit. And I also handle retention and monetization design with respect to live operations. Um, all of this in the, context, uh, in the context of lots and lots of data and uh, lots and lots of games played. Next up, Maria is going to talk a bit about. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this point here. <laughs> As you may notice, um, well, since everyone before me taught you what to do before you launch your game, uh, it's time to talk about the, the lifetime that your game will have once it is launched. So basically, when you launch the game, you feel like you have reached that final sprint and you are the god of everything and your game is out there. But actually, you have to start running some more. <laughs> Because that's where your game actually starts to live, outside of, uh, of this global launch. Uh, basically, you want it to live as much as possible. So it's like, ideally, would be like, I don't know what Clash of Clans has now, six years, five years? Five years would be a decent <laughs> time to target. So basically, you better be prepared for this run. Um, I will talk a little bit about what happens. Actually, this happens in parallel to game development. So what is a minimum viable product? A minimum viable product, what is it to you? Where do you decide that you have plenty of features to support this run that you're going to have ahead of you? Um, and where do you decide that this should be launched and then improved upon? But then, what happens on the market while you work on the product? 
So you are super busy developing and trying to go and reach your deadline. And in the meantime, on the market, I mean, let's admit it, there are other games in your genre. You're not the first one, unless you're one of those crazy niches that Samir presented earlier. Uh, <laughs> So basically, you want to keep up with that and maybe do some adjustments because the minimum viable product changes every single day. Um, I have two examples here. Uh, one is Brothers in Arms 3 um, that started as a single player offline game and turned into this multiplayer mayhem game that was like huge and amazing and played by millions. And then we have our beloved Modern Combat 5 uh, that turned from a multiplayer game, well, the well-known IP for that, to an amazing esports game that you can actually check on Twitch right now because it's like the Red Cup going on. <laughs> um, game evolution actually starts before you launch. I already said that. I'm going to say it again. Um, you need to plan ahead, like a lot. I just said like three moves ahead there, but you're probably going to have to plan a lot more because some of the steps you're going to skip. So basically you want to have like a long list of potential situations that you may encounter uh, for which you have potential solutions. Um, you need to be prepared, basically. You need to carefully dose the content you know you're able to deliver. Um, and this you will split throughout the updates. Uh, you will need to leave a lot of space for these new, featuring, for these new features in your balancing. Uh, because this is one thing I noticed in a lot of games. I play a lot of games on the mobile, so I'm like super addicted. <laughs> Um, so basically, they don't leave much space for, for new features in their balancing. And when they do that, like when they bring on a new feature, it feels a bit off. It's just like something that you slammed on top of something that existed and worked. And basically, it's, it just feels a bit off. Um, you need to adapt as you grow closer to your deadline and you need to constantly reevaluate everything that you've set your mind to do and everything that you planned for this game evolution. I will let Sasha continue here. So um, you released, you've planned ahead, hopefully. Uh, you need to plan quite a lot. What is exactly is this planning that I'm talking about? Um, well, it's a broad term, but um, specifically what I want to discuss here is um, when to launch your content, uh, how to launch it, uh, how to roll it out, and um, what content you're going to launch. And this happens through various means, so it can be as uh, an item, that, a new item that you're releasing for your players, or it can be an update with a new feature or new features. So you have a lot of things like events, DLCs, promotions, a lot of things to take into account. I'm going to talk about some uh, key things to consider that I came across. Uh, first of all, uh, the dread of all producers and game designers. As Maria said, plan in advance as much as possible. You do not have to be super specific about it um, in terms of design, uh, but you need to have a really clear vision of where you're going, otherwise, uh, you may just start patching things along the way, like Maria as well mentioned. Um, so in advance as much as possible, try to keep, um, stick with your vision uh, as much as you can. Um, ideally, uh, you need to release uh, content updates. By that, I mean new cool stuff for your players, but not necessarily features every month. And major features at least two or three months ahead. That's the best case scenario. Um, also, I uh, found that it's a lot better to gradually release that content rather than putting out everything at once. So when your update goes live, that's that. That's the content that your users are going to consume. I'm going to illustrate this with two examples. Um, sorry for not labeling the axis. Uh, hurts every time I see it. So first example is from a game that went all in with updates. 
the production costs were kind of high, so uh, took about two, 2.5 months uh, to uh, release an update. So as you can see there, the trend is always decreasing. It was supported by live operations, um, but on existing content. So for instance, um, users knew the items, they were launched with the update, uh, and then we tried to make use of those items um, between updates know, as rewards for various events and things like that, or promotions, but they already knew that stuff. Second example is from a game where we went for a gradual release of our content. So um, constantly releasing new items uh, in various ways, um, events as well, and so on. Everything was released, and you can see there's an increasing trend, actually. So um, moving forward, how to maintain between those updates um, with some key uh, things that I went through. First of all, is to correlate to holidays, but here you need to leverage whether is it's worth it to go worldwide or go local. Uh, there's a lot of factors involved uh, with this, um, but here's what we did. On a game um, that we had, we had to make a call for the Chinese New Year, whether to go worldwide or to go local. This is a special event that we made. On the left, you can see the Shanghai region from uh, Sniper Fury. And um, on, the, on the right, you can see the event, which is also set in Shanghai, uh, but with um, different environment, uh, cool stuff, and fireworks, and so on. So it's very appealing. We are targeting our Chinese players. And the results, well, they went really, really well in China, 270% uh, increase in revenue. Uh, but it also went really well in other countries. I've only listed here some uh, top countries, uh, but we also saw a good impact in others as well. In some, not a good impact. Altogether, it doubled our revenue. Had we went just with um, release in China, we would have gotten maybe 30, 40% increase. Uh, during that period, during the Chinese New Year, we also launched a lot of items um, in various ways. We also we launched um, items that were targeting our Chinese players, like the ones below. Um, but we also launched items that um, weren't, uh, we might say, not that appearing to our Chinese players. They weren't targeting them. So we tried to cover as many people as possible. Why? Because in live operations, unless you have an army of BPMs or an army of live operations managers, uh, you can't really target every single player in your game. Uh, so you need to cover a wide range of users uh, that come from all, all around the globe. Uh, they behave very differently. Uh, they engage with your game differently. Uh, so because of this, you need to tailor the game um, for a majority of your users as much as, as, much as possible, which means different prices, um, have target different game modes, and so on. Uh, next one is to continuously make users offers that um, they can't refuse. So figure out what works really well in your game, but do, don't run them in parallel. The budget, the user wallet is quite limited. And so you kind of need to paste the content for your users so to have them paying um, or engaged with your game as much as possible. Once you've figured out your recipe um, for live operations, um, you go for patterns, um, you see what has worked, but at some point, uh, even though you're bringing in new items, you're bringing in new events, your users may not be as engaged with them uh, because if you're following a pattern, it is not really new for them. So you need to come up with different things. It can be as simple as modifying a reward in an event, or you know, as big as an entirely new event. Uh, these changes are best done on uh, when, during updates. Uh, so this way, you also balance them with uh, the updates content. So maybe you need to adjust your rewards, maybe you need to adjust your pricing, and so on. And my personal favorite, uh, I always include an A-B testing planning with the calendar and for the planning. 
Um, this allows, uh, allows me to see better the, what I'm testing against the possible noise I'm having from live operations. Uh, it's, it, it makes us pay more attention to what the end users is going to see finally in your game. Uh, so it's going, you, you're going to make it less confusing for your user if you tailor, tailor them versus live operations. Uh, and this way it kind of forces you to uh, make the best of every occasion that you can to run uh, A-B tests and continuously improve um, what you're doing in the game. It can be, I don't know, uh, changing the color of a button or things related to the live operations uh, plan. Okay, so um, you will have to do two types of updates throughout the lifetime of your game. Um, some of them will be to improve existing content. So basically, I'm going to show you an example here. Um, this is from one of our games. We're not going to name it. Um, we have like the top line is the average time per session, and the bottom line is the average number of launches. Um, at this point, we could have said that, hey, stuff is stabilizing, we can go home, we've done our work well, pat ourselves on the back. But we decided to take a risk on the, on the next update that we released and to bring in a new feature just because stuff was, was settling down. And you can see by the results that we haven't damaged the number of launches per day, but we have increased a lot the average time per session. And it was the same energy system. So it used like the new feature used the same energy system as all the others. So basically it wasn't something that players could do on top. It was something that they had to split their time um, when, when starting a session. So I call that a, a good thing with it, right? <laughs> Um, another type of, uh, of updates you're going to do is add new features. Um, and there is like this huge market and there is a lot of money for you there to, to improve your game on. And this is my, my last slide. Um, of course, I think of about balancing all the time. It's like I can't sleep if I don't. <laughs> Um, so it's important at some point during game evolution when you have passed that phase of, oh my god, I need to dilute this little content that I have and try to, to make it last for my players to, to be engaged for a long time until I can release updates. Um, you come back to the game and you look at the balancing and you can rebalance all this, this super hard gating that you had at the beginning at launch uh, just because now you have more content and your players will actually find it more enjoyable to reach a, a better point. And no, it does not harm conversion. Um, so basically you need to review and tweak your onboarding process regularly. I would say every two updates or every time you launch a, a big update with new features, consider the new players. Think about them because they may feel overwhelmed when they enter a game like Candy Crush Saga is now that has like 2,000 levels, I'm a new player, I see all my friends are at level 1,500, and I'm like, I'm never gonna get there because I am stuck at level 33, grinding this for two days now, and it's gonna take me, like, at this pacing, it's gonna take me, what, half a lifetime to reach that point, and they're just gonna go further because more updates will come. So basically, you need to, to think about how the players will actually see the amount of content that you, you have to offer. So thank you, RGDA, for having us here. <laughs> and thank you, everyone, for attending. Questions? <laughs> oh, I was people. hoping not to have questions. <laughs> Uh, test. Okay. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Nice Deadpool shirt. 
Uh, and uh, as a project manager, me and my team, we have the responsibility of making money. And that's all the projects in this room that have to do. And the freemium model is based on making more money. You give the core loop and you give extra to your users. But can you tell me which are the KPIs that dictate the behavior of the users so you can answer your question more thoroughly? What do I need to do, what do, I need to do next? What is the next bundle that I have to implement in my game so I can double my profit and ensure that at the end of the month uh, I reach the standard that uh, I have to reach, sorry, uh, in terms of sales? Thank you. Um, that's actually a really, really good question because at some point you release a lot of stuff, a lot of uh, live operations opportunities. Um, they all come together or at once or maybe in different patterns. So yes, it may be a bit difficult to analyze them. It's an ecosystem. You cannot analyze this event um, and this promotion. You kind of, oftentimes you need to take them together. So um, there's a number of KPIs that you look at depending on the game. Um, obviously you start from what you want to analyze in particular. So let's say you made an event. Let's analyze what would that event could have possibly monetized. And here go directly, like you're selling something, uh, how much revenue that brought in, uh, but also indirectly. So if users were more engaged, maybe they spent on energy, if you have an energy system. So you think of all the things that may have contributed to your revenue, and you analyze that. In the longer run, you look at uh, major KPIs, such as your, uh, well, my personal favorite, which is the average revenue per DAU. Uh, that's the most relevant and the first one that gives you a hint of what is going on and where you should dig deeper. And there on, you can go for each live operation in particular and search it out. Hope that answers your question. Uh, one other thing um, I'd like to add is watch out for cannibalizing features. So basically when you introduce something new, make sure it does not kill other features of your game. Oh. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Well, so I'm going to be quick because I see that uh, we are in uh, a short time. So you mentioned at some point that you do live ops and uh, KPI driven decisions. So my question would be how exactly is that happening at Gameloft? For example, if you have a game and you scan it, how exactly are you defining the next steps to do and what's the process behind that? And maybe exactly I'm more interested to hear about your connection with the game designers and how do you work together because I understand that this might be something that you do together. Yeah, we complement each other a lot um, as GED and BPM. So basically uh, during production phases, I paved the way for the BPMs <laughs> to, um, to have a big playground. Um, and during game evolution, we work like super closely together um, and we take most of the decisions together along with the designers. So it's never just like us. Uh, we're not dictating anything, we're discussing everything and the designers bring in more data and we bring in more data and at the end we have an agreement. <laughs> Um, said uh, what she said, yes, it's super, super important that you get along with your designers, that um, both parties argument properly, both with data and market knowledge. Um, I do agree, sometimes designers get to be um, more creative, uh, and as BPMs are she more hates numbers that oriented. I don't. <laughs> Um, so that's why we need to work together and realize um, each other's point of view and that uh, we have different positions because uh, we know some things better and you know, make room for the other person to bring in their expertise. Yeah, it's a yes. Game of Thrones. One, one, one <laughs> final question. Um, thank you for your talk, very interesting. Um, I wanted to ask, um, when you introdu introduce a new monetization feature, uh, what is what are the KPIs that say, okay, this uh, was a good idea, or this is a bad idea? Obviously, the money the future makes, that's one thing, of course, that's the obvious. But 
what is beyond that? Uh, how do you analyze uh, when you go more in depth? Because, for example, Scott uh, Humphreys mentioned this morning that uh, you have to make sure you uh, respect the users. And if you, uh, if you put in a feature that is kind of begging for money, uh, maybe how do, how do you decide on that? We, we will, most of the time we avoid putting in features that are super greedy and that is mostly thanks to our game designers that <laughs> draw a line somewhere. <laughs> uh, because I must admit, I'm a greedy person when it comes to, to revenues. Uh, and <laughs> what? There's no shame in that. <laughs> I'm supposed to be like this. Um, and um, usually we, we try not to... I'm trying to find another word for... Uh, for cheating really over bad the players. <laughs> uh, we don't want them to feel cheated. Basically, we, we just want to offer them an awesome experience no matter what. So no matter if they pay or they don't. Because a, u a quality user is a quality user. So even if he doesn't pay, he will still be in multiplayer and he will still be there for all the guys that want to play at 2 a.m. and have a lot of money to play at 2 a.m. Um, so basically, I would not dismiss any player. I I respect them as well. I just want their money. <laughs> uh, uh, um, so one thing that I want to This question to was about the KPI, so I'm gonna let. You uh, so <laughs> you've work. noticed in the revenue trends that I showed that I showed that I went particularly for revenue and not uh, ARPU. The reason I did that is because it doesn't matter what those uh, what EAU those games have. Well doesn't matter to some extent, but uh, in the end, it, yes, revenue is what matters, but it, there's more things that contribute to that. So it's the monetization potential of the features, but also retaining your users. If you don't have the users, they're not gonna pay. So that's precisely why I've evaluated those on revenues, taking into consideration that uh, saying, okay, we have this big ARPU for this event, um, that's not really relevant if in the end your revenue isn't that high and it's low because your users left because they're not enjoying that. You're forcing them. So basically you look at a lot of KPIs and they will lead you to a lot of things and you will keep digging and two weeks after you may have an idea of what's going on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.